I do have a couple of notices, I mean, inevitable, but no good. So let me just uh, go through those first with you. First of all, apologies to people who have been going to the website looking for links to the live stream uh, videos. Uh, I had a great plan of action this morning to get a whole load of stuff up there and linked, and this was totally thwarted by the fact that the uh, internet refused to allow me any access to its resources. So um, I have put some stuff on this afternoon and more will be going on tonight. So um, please don't despair of finding those links. I assure you that I am doing my best to try and get it all out there. Um, what you will find if you go is uh, we started to put up the table talk discussion. So please do go and have a look at those. And um, if you click on the link, they're, they're all listed by, by day. And if you click on the links, it'll take you through to the notes that were taken in that session. So I haven't done anything with those except put them up on the web. And with each of those sets of notes, there's also a box where you can put comments in. So uh, if you want to add anything to what's been said there, and maybe you're at that discussion group or something that's said there, strikes you, then put a comment with the appropriate set of notes and then that just makes it easier for us to connect up things together. But also on the main page itself, you can put any general comments. And one or two people have already posted some stuff there, their responses to some of the things that have been said, their thoughts of how we might um, uh, phrase ideals and objectives and so on. So as I said before, that's very much a community project, a common project. So do go and engage with that. Because the more people that do that, the richer it is for all of us to uh, and, and the more it also becomes when we make our conference statement or when we commit ourselves to certain plans of action, the more it becomes something that we can own ourselves as a community. It's not some foreign thing imposed on us by experts from on high, but it's something which we've worked together as a community to develop. And we can own it and celebrate it and put it into action. And, uh, you know, my own personal experience is that it's only when I really engage with something at that personal level that I do actually go away and do something to change my behaviour. So, you know, it's a multifunctional thing, but don't get stuck in. The other thing to say is that um, uh, I posted, I posted, our posters will be remaining up. So if you haven't seen the page of posters, do please go and have a look at them. We have some great posters that cover some really interesting topics, and there's a lot of material to get your teeth into. Go and have a look at them and just be at one of the, the presenter, you know, over the breakfast table or over lunch and talk to them about their poster. And one of the things that I'll try and do this evening after the meeting is to get up the um, actual uh, PDFs of the posters and the handouts. So they're there on the website if you want to go and look for them there, download them when you get home, that sort of thing. Um, I don't think I have any other notices. Does anybody else have any information they want to impart? And I immediately just remember that I didn't have a couple of things to say. So just to give you a slight prior warning, these things will be in the week and they'll be on the website and you'll be reminded of them tomorrow. But just get this into your consciousness now so you can start bedding down in your thinking processes for the last couple of days. On Friday, the memorial service is going to be at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, immediately after lunch, and not at 2 o'clock. And then at 2 o'clock, we're going to be having a, um, a workshop, which Alan is going to lead for us, Alan Messer, who spoke to us about uh, the, the right to food. And I will give you more details about that in the week uh, and on the website tomorrow. But just get that into the week, because again, that's going to be something that's very participative, and it's part of this whole process of us engaging the issues. Now, I've actually been promoted 
tonight as well. So not only do you have to listen to the beginning of the notices, but it's also my pleasure to introduce the speaker. And uh, this is a topic that I am really interested in hearing about because one of the things I did um, a couple of months ago as part of my own preparation for this upcoming conference was I decided that I would keep just for a week a diary of what I wasted. And I was totally convinced that I was a very economical user of food. And uh, I, I made a, a scrupulous note of everything which I didn't eat, which I discarded, and of the reason why I felt I had to discard it. And my farm was in a very short space of time, I was making excuses as to, well, actually why it was quite reasonable because I would discount and it didn't really have to count in my diary because it was an exceptional circumstance, um, etc, etc, etc. So, I'm really pleased that we're addressing this topic of waste this evening and I feel that I am going to learn a lot from it. Um, and it's a pleasure to introduce Stephen, Stephen Finn. I'm not going to give you uh, chapter and verse as to all the wonderful things he's done because it's all there for you in the orange book. But just to give you a, a few, uh, a little flavour of his background and why he's such a great person to be talking to us about this. So, um, Stephen actually worked for 25 years in the supply chain sector, but for the last few years his focus has been on sustainability issues and with a particular emphasis on the matter of, of waste. And he founded a, um, what is a company, a unit response ecology, which uh, has a name of changing uh, management practice to encourage sustainability. And he, as part of this, he also teaches courses for uh, innovative thinking in sustainability. And as I say, with a particular in a particular focus on the matter of waste and managing them. Managing waste and so peculiar, but addressing this issue because actually it is a huge issue, waste of food. So I think that we're going to learn a lot this evening. I think we're going to be challenged about our own wastage. And so without more ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Stephen Finn to you. Uh, how many of you have, have sat through a lecture on food waste before? You? All right. Um, well, as Pat said, hopefully, um, hopefully we'll learn a lot tonight together, and um, and I'm going to show a lot of pictures, um, so it's a visually pleasing uh, discussion. I think it should be pretty easy to follow, um, and uh, a lot of stats, which will um, I think open your open your Eyes up to the serious uh, problem with global food waste. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get going. Uh, just a little background. Earlier this year, um, I, I taught a class at uh, and it started in January, and I asked Saul to come in uh, in one of the first sessions and give an overview of um, all of the, uh, his task was to cover all of the problems of the global food system uh, as an introduction to my class. And I gave him 35 minutes to do it. So, uh, so I reciprocated by asking me to talk about the scope of some of the global food waste problem in 40 minutes here. So uh, I think we're even. But, uh, it's, it's a big problem, a huge problem, really. Uh, this talk will build on uh, some, some comments that Saul made uh, earlier this week, um, some points that were covered by others, um, you know, food security, nutrition, uh, the rights of food. Um, and I think it will lead into a workshop tomorrow. I think into uh, Bill's talk uh, tomorrow night as well, so interesting parallels throughout the week. Um, so I think this, this will tie a lot of things together. Um, we'll start off with a couple of definitions. Um, there's food waste and food losses get used interchangeably. Food losses typically, in general sense, involve uh, typically refer to less developed countries where the loss is, is sort of out of their control to some degree due to other factors. Again. When you use the term food waste, it's more uh, more of a matter of choice. You had an opportunity to avoid that that loss, that waste, and uh, and you didn't. So I'm gonna. There's a slight distinction there. It's an important distinction. I'm gonna mainly use food waste for the cost of, for the 
purpose of this discussion. Um, so we're going to talk about um, go through ways we're going to talk about change. We're going to talk about the opportunity to do something about this. Um, we'll also talk about collaboration, uh, technical partnerships, and uh, the urgency that's needed. Um, 2050, we, we you know, talked a little bit about um, 9 billion by 2050, <laughs> uh, a little bit this week. It's only 35 years away. Um, so it's a scary problem. It's a daunting problem. Um, and just stop and think for a minute that it's only 35 years away. And uh, that should get us a little more concerned about it. Um, so with that, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll press ahead. Um, so my goal tonight is to, um, as, as Pat just alluded to a little bit, um, educate you a little bit on this topic um, and uh, make you change agents, uh, hopefully, to where you go around and uh, and does, and does that tally the next time around to show it to other people and ask them what they're doing about uh, wasting their, their uh, personal lives, too. Um, I've been playing two. Um, we've lost touch with the value of our food, uh, and I think that is to the serious detriment of uh, people on the planet. Um, the current waste, uh, state of waste, pollution, and hunger is unsustainable. Um, I think that, at least from my perspective, might make it into the declaration at the end of this week. Um, and then, um, in terms of opportunity, again, as I said, 9 million by 2050, I think it provides a critical opportunity for the world to come together uh, to do that. I think we're going to need a, a global network. Focuses on shared values, uh, and we better do it quick. There's a lot of urgency involved here. So, um, let me show you a lot of pictures like this. Um, this is the trash bin behind a, a uh, pretty high end supermarket close to my house. Um, I literally, as my children can tell you, have hundreds of these pictures. Um, <laughs> they are uh, very easy to get. Um, the best time to get them is in the Sunday afternoon during football season because there's nobody around and you can go and, and take pictures to your heart's content. Um, it is uh, a serious, uh, it's too bad uh, that it's so easy for me to get pictures like this. And uh, you know, there's there's some really high quality material in here that, here that I'm going to touch on. But uh, you'll see a lot of pictures like this. Um, so let's look at a little historical perspective. Um, the food waste in the United States there's a, a 1977 study that uh, estimated that 20% of the food that we produced um, was lost. And at that time, it was 137 million tons and a value of $31 million. Um, two decades later, there was another study. Uh, and at that point, the um, study indicated that we had moved up to 27% of food available for human consumption was wasted. And uh, that was estimated to be uh, 96 billion pounds annually. So, some of these numbers are so big, it's just hard to get your, your head around them, but we'll, we'll try. Um, a big study um, last year, uh, just issued by the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, noted that 40% uh, of the food in the U.S. Uh, is not eaten. So uh, if you put that in an individual perspective, it's about 20 pounds of food per person per month, and our value is now going up to $165 billion, so annually. So, I think about this, and we made a lot of advances in the United States since the 70s. Um, 
um, in terms of food waste, we have regressed uh, seriously. So if you look globally, um, I'll tie in that Pat's gone up before. Um, we'll start with the UK. Um, RAP is a big organization that does a lot of measurement work in uh, food waste in the UK. Um, RAP noted that almost 7 million tons of food uh, per year go to waste in the UK, about 33% of consumer purchases. Um, and interesting points with proper management, um, they felt that 60% of that food could have been eaten. And then a real staggering one, about 25% of that was discarded uh, in a hole or an open state. So um, <laughs> when I think about that, the word uh, cavalier comes to mind. Um, so we're awfully cavalier about uh, what we do with our, with our food. Um, a study by the uh, Stockholm International Water uh, Institute uh, noted that food losses and food waste could be as much as uh, as high as 50 percent uh, from killed before, and that study has gotten a lot of attention too. Uh, if you want to look up on their website, this paper, you can see a little a little bit more detail about how they get there. And they start out at 4,600 calories, and they get down to about 2,000 calories uh, at consumption at the point of consumption. Um, FAO, I'll do a lot of uh, FAO um, studies tonight. Um, FAO noted that about one third of all the uh, food produced for human consumption goes to waste annually. Um, big numbers again now are up to 1.3 billion tons annually. Okay, so take that 1.3 billion and multiply that by 2,000. Big numbers, even bigger. So if we put dollars to that, um, FAO notes that in developing countries that's about 680 billion dollars a year. And if you add developing countries, that's $310 billion a year, combine those, um, and you're at a trillion dollars <laughs> based on food losses. So, off the big number, as uh, Sadaf said the other day, a lot of zeros behind these numbers. Uh, pretty shocking. Let's look at where that occurs uh, and, and by product type. Um, again, from FAO, um, these percentages are all very high. You can see the fruits and tubers and fruits and vegetables. Uh, nearly 50% of those products are wasted. Fish and seafood, about 35%. Dairy products, uh, about almost 20%. So these are all very high um, percentages by food tech. When I think about that, I think uh, one word that comes to mind is unconscionable I mean, when you're talking about food waste of this magnitude. Um, a study by the IME uh, this year, I thought it was a great perspective. It said uh, the potential to provide 60 to 100% more food by simply eliminating losses while simultaneously bringing up land, energy, and water resources for other uses is an opportunity that should not be ignored. And I think that's a great way to look at um, you know, the great amount of waste um, that we have right now and what, you know, what we can, what we should be thinking about in terms of being that billion people by 2050. So what are some of the causes of that food waste? Um, I'm sure we have some people that um, spent some time in, in farms in their youth, and in their youth I know solved it. Um, start, start with nature. Um, you know, obviously, extreme weather pests um, would come to mind for most of us immediately. Um, regulations are an issue too. Um, yeah, loss in transport, loss on the farm in terms of damage from machinery, um, loss during food, uh, food prep and conversion, supply and demand um, issues, and the variability in trying to match up supply with demand very difficult to do in the food sector. Um, another big problem. Uh, at the consumer level, plate waste, um, you know, in situations where buffet mentality, in situations like this where we have a great amount of food to eat, um, there's, it, it tends to lead to a lot of waste as well. Um, but the one on here that I really want to, that I'm going to talk about more tonight is uh, overly selective quality stand standards. And I'll talk, to, talk about this in terms of the quest for perfection that we as American consumers uh, and, and other industrialized nations have, which leads to a lot of waste. Um, in terms of where that food waste uh, occurs um, in developing countries, um, there's a lot of waste that occurs between production and market um, in industrialized countries and in developed. Um, a lot of that waste occurs at market. So uh, there's a difference in where it occurs, but um, when you total it all up, it's about the same, about 40% in, uh, in both groups. We'll get into the details of that. Um, in developing countries, um, as you might imagine, lack of infrastructure is a critical factor. Um, the two things that you need to, uh, to move food to market um, quickly and, and in a safe state, um, good transportation systems and, uh, and good refrigeration. 
And those are lacking in developing countries. Um, no surprise there. So you have a lot of material that's lost in transit. Um, but the interesting thing is once it gets to market in developing countries, um, it tends to be consumed. It doesn't go to waste because simply it's too valuable. And I think we can we all take a lesson from that in, uh, in industrialized countries. Here we have, uh, as we talked about earlier this week, we have a highly efficient transportation system. We can move food from thousands of miles uh, every day very quickly, fly it in, we can bring it in my ship. Um, so food comes from great distances to get here. Um, and we're very efficient at that. Um, but once it gets to market, um, once it gets to our location, we tend to, to waste a lot of it. Um, part of that is um, you know, we have a system where uh, consumers expect um, fully stocked shelves at all times. And so when, when we walk into the supermarket at 11 o'clock, we expect 37 varieties of bread. Um, and we expect them to all be fresh. And at 12 o'clock, when the store closes, um, as a result of that, a lot, a lot goes to waste. We also expect what I call perfect produce. Um, and, you know, the system is, is built to provide uniformity. Um, so um, pieces of fruit, pieces of uh, vegetables that are too big, too small, a little misshapen, uh, don't even make it to market. So they get called out ahead of time. Um, so there's a, a lot of oversupply. There's this demand for uniformity. Um, leads to a lot of waste um, at market. And what we don't even see, at least a lot of waste before, um, before market because it's called out. Um, the result of that, um, we'd love to walk into, uh, and I do too, uh, we'd love to walk into supermarkets and see fully stacked uh, produce uh, shelves like uh, we see on the left. Um, and the cost of that is a lot of waste in the back. Um, you know, then it's full of, full of fruit, full of vegetables that were deemed a little bit beyond their prime, which in many cases is questionable. Um, what happens to those chickens that uh, spin the rotisserie um, for four hours? About four hours and 15 minutes, they're pulled off and they go into the trash in a lot of cases. Um, I took this picture in the winter. The steam was still coming off of these when, uh, when I took this picture. Um, I could have taken about 15 of these home very easily. Um, so a lot of waste in, in that area, too. Um, so again, developing nations, infrastructure is key. In industrialized nations, um, a lot of this waste stems from um, a culture of abundance. And, and really, what I would say is, is uh, which we can change. Um, this culture of abundance that I keep talking about is really, I like to say, it's, it's an illusion, it's a, it's a myth. Um, Christian Stewart, author of a book called Waste, I'm covering the global food scandal, put this better than anyone I've, I've ever seen, and said, industrialized nations need to learn what it means to live in scarcity, because the appearance of infinite abundance is an illusion. I think it's a great way to think about this topic. Resources are finite, they're not going to last forever. Um, we're already seeing signs of, uh, of scarcity in a lot of resources, and uh, we need to do something about that. Um, so how much do we value our food? I think that's a critical question here. Um, all of this waste that you've seen so far, you know, kind of leads one to think, how much do we value our food? Um, and really, beyond that, the resources that go into producing it. Um, and how often do we consider the, you know, the weaknesses of the food system and all the waste that results? I think these are questions that um, we need to be asking ourselves, uh, both in groups like this and at universities and at a much higher level of government all, all across the country and globally. Um, and I'm stunned by the fact that food waste um, is a topic that is largely below the radar, in my opinion. Um, it's not a mainstream issue in industrialized nations. Um, we spend a billion dollars a year in the U.S. to, um, to discard um, food waste. Um, and you know, I, I watched a little bit in the last election to see if any would come up, and I never heard any reference to it. Um, so I think it needs to become a part of national and, and global uh, agendas, and I'll talk about that a little bit too. So, so Sal, that's the scope. Sal has to talk about the significance of global food waste too. Um, and I, I think about this, it has, it has a distinct bearing on the two most pressing issues of our time, which I would say are poverty and hunger, and the environment. Um, and there's a, there's a direct link between uh, food waste and those two issues, I think. Um, in terms of global hunger, you know, nearly a billion people on the planet hungry. We talked about that this week. 12.5% of the global population um, were undernourished from 2010 to 2012. Um, as you all know, about 98% of those individuals live in developing countries. Um, and 2 billion or 7 people on the planet, 7 billion people on the planet, um, now facing one on 
um, one micronutrient deficiencies right now. So um, pretty significant um, in terms of global hunger. Um, in the U.S., let's take that uh, look more closely at home. <coughs> um, you know, shocking statistics as well. 50 million Americans, one in six, living in food insecure households. 17 of them, million of them children, 5 million of them seniors. Um, in a recent study put out by UNICEF, uh, <laughs> uh, relative child poverty um, among industrialized nations, and the U.S. ranked 34 out of 35 um, in that study. So um, we're talking about the most prosperous nation on the planet here. So um, it doesn't, it, it really shows me how serious um, hunger problems are in the, in the U.S. as well. Um, great significance in terms of lost calories. Um, Wasted food with food prevents uh, needed calories um, from reaching people that need them, reaching the need. Um, and another statistic from, from the FAO, if we could save just one quarter of the food that uh, is currently going to waste annually, um, it would be enough to feed um, all of the people uh, across the globe. So pretty, pretty amazing if you think about the scale. Um, also, in terms of significance, it's not just the food, but it's the, it's the nutrients. Uh, it's the quality of that food. Um, all too often, very high quality calories go to waste. Um, it's very easy for me to find this. A um, couple of shots here. Um, ribeye steaks, um, strip steaks, um, spare ribs, uh, hamburger on the left side. Um, beautiful strawberries, uh, potatoes, peppers, all kinds of vegetables on the right side. So. Uh, again, it, those are high quality calories for people um, in, uh, in areas like food deserts need. We talked about obesity this week, Barry talked about it, Sandy talked about it a little bit. Um, you know, alarming statistics in the U.S., more than a third of Americans are obese, 17% um, of them children. Um, rates have skyrocketed, um, doubling in children, tripling in adolescents in the last 30 years. Um, so those high quality calories that we're talking about here one way, I think, toward um, mitigating the, the problems that occur in food, uh, in food deserts in this, in this country. Um, and let's get into the environmental factors, which are, which are serious, too. Um, agriculture, um, biggest user of water. Someone mentioned, I think Bob mentioned yesterday, uh, yesterday that um, you know, water is going to be the key issue uh, in the next several decades. And, in my mind, there's no question that that's the case. Um, you know, agriculture uses about 70% of the water that's consumed uh, on the planet annually. Um, so it's very safe to say that wasted food is <coughs> wasted water. Um, when we waste food, we waste a lot of water. Um, and here's FAO again, the loss of water through food waste would easily meet the household water needs of the 9 billion people expected on the planet. Um, and I like that one because that's a great way to look at this problem. It's, it's, forward, it's looking forward. Um, and saying we have great needs in 2050, um, and what we're doing now um, you know, could go a long way toward, we fixed it, could go a long way toward, toward helping solve that problem. Um, I was encouraged um, yesterday, uh, day before people were, were asking where the word sustainability was uh, in some documents, and that's, that's the way we need to think. We need to be thinking along those lines, in my opinion. Um, waste of food is, uh, equals air pollution, no question about it. Um, um, Tom's here from EPA. Uh, EPA knows a lot about this. Um, food waste is a um, major component of uh, what comprises our landfills in this country. Um, it uh, produces global, uh, it produces uh, methane gases and decomposes, which is uh, 20 to 25 times more harmful, or as more, uh, 20 to 25 times more global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So uh, it's a serious uh, contributor to, uh, to climate change. Um, so Decreasing the amount of food waste uh, in landfills would, would be a very positive thing for us to accomplish. Um, wasted food is also wasted energy. Again, from FAO, um, U.S. food waste alone represents three, uh, 300 million barrels of oil per year. 4% um, of our nation's oil use is a big number. Um, and again, we're, we're spending, as I said before, we're spending uh, more resources to, uh, to all that food waste away to landfills as well. So, pretty frightening stats there. Anyone, uh, how many people have grown up on farm? Uh, right on a farm? So, 
didn't understand what you asked. Okay. Did anyone with a farm background that you know wasted food? So wasted food equals wasted resources, right? Um, think about all those agricultural in inputs that went uh, into producing food that goes to waste. Um, fertilizer and pesticides come to mind. But think about all the labor that was uh, went into that food, think about the planting, think about all the human capital um, that went into it. So it's a tremendous waste of resources as well. Um, serious impact on soils. Um, wasted food really causes. Um, you know, it's tied to uh, soil depletion. Um, the way to look at this, um, the meats and the dairy products wasted uh, in the U.S. and the U.K. alone require 8.3 million hectares. Um, and since we're in New York, uh, I'd equate that to New York. That's about two-thirds the size of the state of New York. So uh, pretty um, compelling statistics there. Uh, and this press for land, is Stuart does a great job on this too, this press for land is disrupts the climate, disrupts the hydrological cycles, um, and as he says, threatens to reduce the productivity of land out of land by 25% this century. When you think about that, at a time when we're gearing out toward to um, handle another two billion people, so just at the time when we need to uh, maximize the productivity of our food production, we're threatening the very soils that produce it. So, a scary thought. Uh, in terms of the impact of land, wasted food, uh, Results in increased landfill use. Uh, food that doesn't go to compost uh, uses up limited space, it's unsightly, it smells, but it also increases landfill requirements. Uh, landfill requires landfills end up polluting groundwater, um, and as we said before, pollute uh, the air too. So, a lot of crop environmental problems associated with that. So, when I step back and I think about all this, I kind of view the food system as a dysfunctional circle. Um, we produce vast quantities of food in this global food system. We go to great effort to distribute it, store it, stage it for sale, um, and then somewhere through that process, a lot of that food uh, passes our quality standards, um, and we end up discarding it. We spend even more resources to haul it away, um, and we put it up into a landfill where it causes even more problems for us, as it decomposes. So, um, not a great picture. We lose half uh, food all, all along the way as we do that. So the impact of that, um, when we're producing more than we need. We're using limited uh, valuable finite resources in the process to produce food that we eventually discard. Um, in the final stages of that, we inflict more harm on the environment um, by disposing of it and bring that back to uh, people who fail to make use of a billion tons of food annually they can go toward. We work um, eight hours a day to produce ten items, knowing that at the end of the day we would throw out five of them. We would pay money to throw them to have them all the way, and we would inflict more harm to the environment uh, if we do so, um, and keep valuable resources where the people need it. So it's kind of crazy. Um, so the result of all that, again, as we talked about, wasted nutrition, wasted resources. Um, there's some shots behind markets. Um, uh, farmers markets, supermarkets, and, uh, and community gardens, even where you wouldn't expect to see um, wasted food. Um, typically, some of the findings that I come across, um, you know, it's bad enough, or um, I mentioned before, our supermarkets stock a lot of bread, um, a lot of um, baked goods, donuts, bagels, Danish. Um, so you can find those very easily. It's, it's bad enough to, to find those. Um, because there's a lot of resources going to waste there. Um, but far worse is when you see all kinds of shots of, uh, of very high quality calories in terms of uh, fresh fruit and, uh, and produce going to waste. Um, very disconcerting. Um, and last, in terms of significance, we have to think about this in terms of global security. Um, so, how secure are, is a world where we have a billion people hungry, um, living in communities next to, one, next to people who are uh, you know, we have plenty we have access. Um, as someone mentioned earlier this week, you know, where it's a world where obesity and hunger coexist. And uh, that's not the recipe for a secure world. Um, Saul talks often about, um, uh, about um, social unrest being linked, to, uh, you know, almost always being linked to, to food crises. And, and, uh, so it's a, it's a food insecurity is a definite problem. Uh, 
in terms of global security, and uh, you know, it's it's not just a problem for uh, less developing countries. And I think there's a moral problem here, which I think everyone can relate to. Um, we talked this week about you know all individuals having a basic right to food and to adequate nutrition. And that will probably come out of declaration to some degree. Um, and yet we discard these immense quantities of food enough to totally eliminate hunger yearly. Um, so on, on moral grounds around uh, moral grounds alone, I'd say that producing food waste should be a global priority. So to sum all of that up, I think there's a big disconnect here, as I said earlier. We waste these vast quantities of food. We have one in eight across the globe hungry. Um, we still need to feed another two billion by 2050, only 35 years away. Um, our resources are severely challenged now, and um, the environment is, in, you know, is already suffering from you know, our current system. And we need to find um, sustainable ways to close that calorie gap that's anticipated between now and 2050. So what do we do about all this? It's a pretty scary picture. Um, I think, um, as I've been reflecting on this for the last several months, um, typically when you talk about the 9 billion by 2050 problem, um, it's a serious problem, it's a daunting challenge. Um, and I start to think that um, I think we need to reframe a little bit. I think we need to look at the 9 billion by 2050 problem as an opportunity. Um, it needs an effective global network to uh, to address it, to be able to help us provide food in um, a secure way for that vast number of people. To get there, we need to, to focus on the opportunity, um, and we need to think you know, along sustainability lines. We need to urgency. But I think we all need to transform our mindset to, to one of uh, embracing this as an opportunity to uh, create a more secure world. Um, and a better role for, for everyone by the time 2050 gets here, which is not that far away. Um, as I said before, food waste, well, food waste is not a mainstream issue. I think part of this is we need to make it a uh, mainstream issue. Um, I think the fact that it is not to date shows that um, you know, there's a lack of understanding of the, of the social, the environmental, the economic um, benefits that um, we could attain by reducing food waste. So I think we need to make it a much more mainstream issue. Um, and I think we need to um, really get on uh, board in terms of creating increased awareness of the scale of this problem uh, among amongst consumers, business, governments, and we need to then take that awareness and translate this into action um, as part of this broad collaborative effort that we're talking about to uh, to help optimize resources and help get us to a secure world by 2050. Um, Awareness and education are key uh, at the start. Um, people need to, to understand that we have choices right now regarding excess food. Um, EPA does a nice job of putting a hierarchy on their website and getting word out about that. Um, and the best thing we can do is not waste it in the first place, but once we produce it, um, you know, there are other options besides throwing it out, like feeding hungry people, feeding animals, industrial uses, composting. The last thing we want to do is throw it in a landfill where it causes more problems for us. So how do we make this second nature for all? I think that's part of that mainstream process. Um, and go further and create partnerships that, that um, capture some of this excess food and put it to good use. Um, I think doing that requires that we all think about food much differently than we are today. Uh, I think we need to value our resources much more. Um, Someone mentioned the short term versus the long term focus earlier this week. Uh, definitely need a more long term view um, in our economic system. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and again, to get to get more mainstream on this, we need, we need my mindset change. We need, uh, we need people thinking more about um, planet um, and the environmental issues and the social issues of all of this food waste um, you know, to make some headway in this, in this area. Um, as far as this process, um, you know, change is hard. There's always barriers to overcome. Um, I mentioned this lack of awareness before. Um, I think there's a lack of concern amongst individual, you know, mainstream countries, people, um, mainstream America. There's a lack of concern about global food waste, and I think that really stems from a lack of awareness. So, um, creating that awareness is, is going to be key toward moving 
they can cause a change against the trial. Um, I think yeah, I've heard also that you know there's a, a view that um, good ways to not going back to good ways to choose um, it's a problem for the next generation. Um, environmental issues are a problem for the next generation and that's not a, a mindset that we can afford I don't think. Um, we need to think more long term. Um, when creating partnerships, um, there, are, there are barriers to overcome too. There's, there's a fear of liability. There's a fear that some of these partnerships to cap our access food in the industry it, um, is just too difficult. Um, it's in the way of my current operations. It's going to be too costly to me. So we need to get by that. Um, and part of that, I think, is um, you know, discarding food in this country is just more too easy. And we're just geared toward doing it. Um, so a uh, change in that area would be helpful. You know, I think one key thing also is there's, there's been an unwillingness to move away from this current economic model that we have, which is um, you know, doesn't factor in the environmental externalities associated with things like food waste. Um, so we need to get there too. I'll talk about that in a minute. So we need urgent change. Um, I think the food waste needs to get on the national agenda, and I think it also needs to be a global priority. Um, to do that, I think it needs a global network approach. Um, which is going to involve collaborative partnerships um, and a sense of urgency. Um, there was a, an individual, John Richard, about 10 years ago, wrote a, a paper called The New Global Agenda. And um, he listed 20 uh, what he thought were the key global, most pressing global problems. Um, I listed several of them there. And he talked about a new framework for attacking them. And I was struck by the fact that on the left side there, um, how many of them, his first eight, really um, related to uh, or somewhat tied to food waste? Uh, global warming, fisheries depletion, deforestation, water issues, um, um, safety issues, uh, society related to food security. Um, so I think he, he was spot on in terms of saying that we needed a, a new global network to, uh, to attack these problems. Um, I was thinking about that. Um, you know, he calls for, for network teams. Um, you know, this has an appeal to universal values. Um, it has an appeal to our global citizenship. Um, so, in many ways, you know, it can help bring the world closer together. Um, so, again, I think he had a, a great concept there. I was thinking about this in terms of um, another book that I read, the, the End of Poverty by U.S. And uh, part of that book, uh, we talk about a great crisis offers great opportunity. And I was putting those two themes together. And you know, I think that global food waste definitely is, is intertwined with the dual problems of hunger and the environment, as we talked about. And so, I, as I said before, I think we need to start thinking about food waste as a huge opportunity in the context of, uh, of the 9 billion by 2050 problem to, to both eliminate hunger. Um, and to optimize resources and, and save the environment so that um, when we do get to 2050, we have not only adequate food, but we have um, a safe environment in which to live. Um, I think if you look at that just alone in terms of 9 billion by 2050, it can be difficult to, to, to think about it in terms of how to advance that cost. And so I think. There's benefits breaking it down into, into pieces. And I, I worked on this for a while, and I listed 10, 10 ways that I thought we could advance, um, make headway against 9 billion by 2050 in terms of reducing global food waste. And, and I'm sure you could come up with some more, maybe you will tonight. Um, but I just want to go through some of those. Um, first one, you know, expand, always you know, beginning with awareness. I think um, we can expand national and global awareness. Um, and, and up our education efforts on food waste. Um, I think there's a there's a suppressed discomfort that we have with food waste. We know it's wrong. We tend to waste a lot of it, and we're uncomfortable about talking about it. So I think more awareness will, will help people come to grips with that and, and take action to reduce their their individual behavior. Um, I think definitely need action to, to change this cultural culture of abundance that I, I mentioned earlier. Educate people on the value of food. Um, I think we need a, a new compact between consumers and retailers where consumers um, shouldn't expect to have 37 choices of bread at 10.30 on a black and night that are perfectly fresh. And 
and they shouldn't expect for it to be uniform produce um, 24 hours a day. Um, it should it should be willing to accept the variety. Uh, you know, it, it's it's all nutritious food, and, and uh, it doesn't zucchini doesn't want to be exactly eight inches long. If it's uh, ten or if it's six, it's still going to provide high nutrition content. So um, I think that if, if consumers are educated and more willing to accept um, less than perfect produce and uh, willing to accept less than fully stocked shelves at all times. I think uh, they can drive change amongst the retailers, and I think that's an important, an important place to start. Um, I think, as I mentioned a little bit, we can do this problem as, as a great way to make inroads toward eliminating hunger. Um, it's something that we have to do. Um, there's, a, there's a great need to think more long term on this, and there's a great need to create partnerships to capture um, excess food and to, do, uh, and to put that food to good use. It's something that I've done in Pennsylvania. Uh, Bill is, is well familiar with uh, his organization does this all the time. <coughs> John Rouse is doing great work on this in Boston. Um, um, Tom does great work on this with uh, the EPA. So there are, there are lots of opportunities to create partnerships to create um, food waste tomorrow. Um, the recent class that I, that I taught, um, the class's focus was to create uh, an awareness campaign on food waste and it's been the semester. Um, doing that, they put on an event, uh, an event on campus and it was very successful, got donated to food, and we got the ways to uh, test it out to students on campus and, and made two videos to, uh, about the, the, the process and the theme, and it was very successful. Um, and a lot of both local and global reach, so um, we need more, more, more projects like that, I think, too. But, um, the key thing is we need a global commitment to eliminate poverty and hunger. Um, and I think we have a great incentive to do that in terms of the time going by 24 um, We saw some of the environmental problems caused by food waste. Um, so I think another opportunity here is to embrace this, this uh, challenge <coughs> as uh, a way to make significant uh, contributions to the environment. Um, you know, this rising population puts great strain on uh, resources. We're going to have 2 billion more people. Many of them will be uh, you know, entering the middle class. We'll have more. Um, purchasing power than they had before, so they're going to put even more strain on, on the resources. Um, so uh, that's a, yet another opportunity. Um, another way to look at this is to see it as a, a challenge to making roads on obesity and health. Um, you know, obesity uh, currently costs a you know, recent cost of $147 billion per year. We, we simply can't afford that, as I mentioned earlier this month, you know, as well as the lost productivity and the lost. Um, you know, the health issues, the other health issues that result from that. Um, so capturing, redirecting excess food can really um, help mitigate the problems of food deserts, I think, and um, help make the roads on obesity and health issues. Um, it also provides a great opportunity to build community on a great, at a much greater level. Someone stopped me from uh, back earlier today and talked about building community. And this is a great way to look at this uh, issue to uh, it's not only local community, which is great, but it's building nations, bringing nations together in a global effort to, to solve a problem that everyone has a vested interest in solving. Right? So I think it's a, it's an opportunity to, to create unprecedented unprecedented collaboration, um, and, and really um, we should be well motivated to do it because the fate of the planet uh, really depends on it. Um, innovative partnerships, I, I mentioned before, um, it's a great opportunity to, to bring people to, together to develop partnerships to. Uh, to capture food and put it to good use. Um, there's, there's much potential to do that. There's a lot of people, as we saw, that desperately need high quality calories. Uh, as part of that, I think we can create really effective national and global awareness campaigns to help with that. Um, I haven't talked too much about business, um, but this is a great way to harness the power of business as well. Business has the incentive to uh, embrace sustainability initiatives. Um, it's crucial for survival of business. Um, so not going by 2050 presents great opportunities for business to uh, to get involved and, and make contributions to both people and the planet. Um, it's a great way to, to move toward a new economic system, I think, too. Um, we talked earlier today about you know environmental costs not getting factored into um, the business equation. Um, we're in this you know, take big waste uh, model where um, <coughs> We take inputs, we produce a product, and we harm the environment. We uh, producing outputs, 
that are have a negative impact on the environment. Um, there's a, a, a theme out there, uh, capitalism 3.0, which uh, you know, talks more about mimicking nature, um, taking inputs from one process and uh, and using them, um, taking outputs from one process and then inputs in another. So um, it's more regenerative. Uh, it has less, uh, you know, it doesn't harm the environment. Um, as Charmer says at MIT, it's more of an ecosystem awareness model versus an ecosystem awareness model. So, um, good potential for, for business to embrace more of a capitalism 3.0 uh, model. I think it's a great opportunity to scale up um, and, and get some experience in, in coordinating large plans. I was thinking about this in terms of the Olympic Games. You know, every four years the world comes together and put on this great show. Um, and there's typically lots of accolades given to the people that organize that. It involves tremendous collaboration, uh, bringing together huge amounts of resources and energy in there. Um, what better um, project to do to bring worldwide resources together than you know, reducing food waste and trying to, to uh, make contributions to the 9 billion by 2050 realm? Someone mentioned earlier today, uh, earlier this week, um, you know, programs to put people uh, who are out of work or are looking for work. Um, to work in terms of capturing food, um, you know, there are opportunities, I think, for New Deal type programs to do that. So um, we can think along those lines as well. Uh, and last, I think just a, it's a huge opportunity to change the world for the better. Um, so again, minimizing global food waste, there's great opportunities for hunger uh, and for improving the environment um, and creating a more secure world for everyone. So um, I think about this in terms of Crowdsourcing with Uber purpose, right? It's a great way to bring the entire world together to unleash its creative value, um, and creative potential for good value, for good purpose. Um, so to conclude and get back to the takeaways earlier, um, global food waste is it's an enormous problem. It's definitely linked to the problems of hunger uh, in the environment that we face today. I think our values are, are just way out of balance right now. I think we've lost uh, touch with the value of our food, as I said earlier. Um, and that has serious implications for for the planet and, uh, and for the 870 million people that are hungry. Um, I think the current state of waste, pollution, and hunger is unsustainable. Um, again, we're going to have to deal with two, 2 billion more people here in 35 years with increased purchasing power. Um, so we need to, uh, to change our behavior now. We get out of path to, to be ready to handle that. Um, we simply can't afford to waste 30 to 50 percent of our food uh, any longer. We can't afford the environmental impacts that that waste um, uh, provides. We need urgent change now. I think I think looking at a collaborative global network uh, of a very grand scale, with, uh, which harnesses a lot of expertise amongst business, individuals, governments, um, acting with urgency, acting with shared purpose, um, is what's needed. Um, yeah. It's, it's definitely a key thing to uh, to embrace globally right now um, in order to create a more secure world. Uh, it's an essential journey that um, all nations are going to need to participate in. Uh, and it's an opportunity that um, I don't think uh, can be missed. It's, it's something that I think we just have to do. Um, so. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. I was, I ended up, I, I began by feeling totally overwhelmed with all the facts and figures because they're just so staggering. They're just so staggering. And I was, I was trying to send some tweets as well, and I, I was just thinking, oh, this is such a bad statistic. I, I just had to make a record of this. And then the next one's even worse. So there was a moment when I felt, what can we do? I just kind of submerged under this great weight of wasted food. And I just felt, oh. But then I really was encouraged by the way you ended, actually. And I really like that idea of turning the problem into a series of opportunities as a way of getting
getting a handle on that and of finding something that you can get a grip onto and, and a way into thinking about it positively. So I just want to say thank you for that because I found that really helpful. And uh, it's one thing that I have felt this week is, uh, you know, as we listen to these presentations, you just can feel totally helpless in the face of all the, all the information and uh, think that we're doomed. There's nothing we can do about it. But we felt that you gave a really kind of good, encouraging, you know, think creatively, think positively, see this as an opportunity and get stuck in there and, and work at it like that. And I personally found that really encouraging. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. I had some as we were kind of uh, working through, but uh, it would be great to take some questions. Right. Do you want to take them? Um, uh, okay, all right. So let's do the usual thing. Come up to the microphone. And, oh, there's already a few people. I said they were talking. I didn't notice. Okay. Here's the microphone. Without more ado. We're going to leave the microphone here so that you can actually be seen. Please identify yourselves. Okay. Um, my name is Solomon Katz, and uh, uh, my name is Hugh Joseph. I appreciate your presentation. I agree totally with the need and the importance of reducing and trying to eliminate waste in every way possible. But I can't say that I agree with your overall premise here, that there is a real connection between the waste we have throughout the food supply and the elimination or reduction of hunger uh, currently or in the long term. It, you know, you can, you can say that if we could find ways to modify safety regulations and so on and get some of the food that gets thrown away at events and bring that to homeless shelters and so on, we could feed some hungry people. I, I would accept that as a, as a small step, but we're talking about large-scale global hunger um, in, in 2050. Let's look at it in, in 2013. We produce enough food right now to feed everybody in the world. And the fact that a lot of it goes to waste um, is not, does not mean that if it didn't go to waste, those people would get fed. And most of us know that uh, solutions to hunger are, are much more complex and, and, and we do too. So the question becomes then, you know, why would the elimination uh, of, of waste or the significant reduction of waste solve that problem? Now I think we, have, we all grew up with, you know, I know in, in my family we would say finish what's on your plate because people in China are, are starving. Um, now in China they say things are going to like these people in, in the U.S. are, are starving. But nonetheless, if we all finished what's on our plate, we'd all be a lot, a lot bigger. So, so that's not an answer. Um, I, I would have to say that the environmental um, factors, uh, the wasted resources and wasted land in that are, are compelling aspects of providing enough capacity to increase food production if we need to in the future. But I could also solve that problem by reducing the amount of animal products that we produce and consume in this country and around the world to levels that are healthy for us and our diet and for the planet. So that in itself is, is in a sense a concept of waste by simply producing foods that we shouldn't be eating and then consuming them. So it's a kind of a structural uh, part of it. And, and so I, I think I'll stop at that, but I just wanted to make that point because I, I don't quite see the, the, the ease of saying if we could get rid of all the waste 
today or in before 2050 that people in 2050 are all going to get fit? Well, I think we could. Um, I think the challenge isn't doing it, right? And I haven't. There are going to be a lot of people, and we need to have a lot of people thinking about how we do that, right? So we've said for decades that the um, problem of hunger in the world is a distribution problem, right? And um, as you said, we don't, we don't get food to all the people need, right? So I think we're entering a new era where we can get it. It's, it's still a very difficult issue, but um, I think we're going to advance uh, with proper thinking and a concerted effort to do it. I think there are ways to um, make a lot of headway in terms of capturing this excess um, and actually getting it to the people into places that um, that need it. Um, you know, we have a couple of thousand food banks in the country in the country right now that, that work on this, you know, at local and regional levels to um, update hunger in their communities, right? So, um, and the fact, as you mentioned, and as we saw in here, that we um, you know, we produce enough food now to feed the world, and, and we, um, you know, if we produce that, if we capture a quarter of that food, we can feed the planet back. It's just, um, I, I think there are, with different thinking and, and different technologies and different commitments, um, and, and global commitments to doing that, I guess my perspective is um, we're going to have to capture that food. I'm not saying it's easy, but we're going to have to do it. Um, and we can't just simply continue to operate um, and leave a billion people um, without adequate nutrition. Um, so I guess my perspective would be, no, not easy. Um, we can do it, we, and I don't think we have a choice to do it. So it's, it's, it's Tony Miller, and thank you, Steve, for the compassion that moves you to go out and take those pictures you know, and see the pain that you know is behind the amplification somehow. Two points. Um, I tend to think bottom line thinking, and the bottom line in this case is thermodynamics. Um, if you buy a gas like guzzler car, it will get you to zero to 60 real fast. If you buy a Prius, it won't. And the difference is power. And this is the power relationship. If you want power, you have to waste a lot of expenditures. Um, profit is equal to power. That's the analogy. We have created a system that maximizes profit for the people at the top. Um, the only way to do that is to create a very wasteful system. And they know that. So we're offering hot, we're, the solutions we're saying is, but it would save us a huge amount of cost. Conservation does not make for profit making. Conservation saves everybody at our expenses, but doesn't create the imbalance for the people at the top. So we really have to recognize that if we're going to change this paradigm, we will have to change the profit making paradigm of capitalism. The idea that we can have great profit to do what we do simply doesn't work from a thermodynamic, energetic perspective. So that's the first thing. I think we just have to recognize the people at the top who make it wasteful so that they can make profits. And with the change and make it much more balanced, they won't have it. So we can't argue profitability of business, although I agree that business can be brought in. They can be brought in by saying you'll make more profits because conservation will never do that. It saves costs for everybody. The second thing is, why did they do that? How did they do that? And why are we so gullible? And I think there we have to look seriously at one of the greatest technological achievements of the 20th century, at least from the perspective of capitalism, and that is the evolution of the psychological principles by which um, demand creation has been achieved. Advertising and the way we are constantly swimming in a media that is telling us, a commercial media that is telling us what we want and how uh, mercurial our tastes need to be to stay abreast of what we want. And so we live in a very waste uh, consumptive society. So 
again, that's something we have to look at, but also we have to look at how it's come about and what we do to start speaking out against the way the media have conditioned us to be materialists. So I know it's a little complicated, those two points. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. I think you're, I agree with you on the, you know, the need for a new economic model. Um, I think you sound like you embrace that capitalism 3.0 concept a little bit. And, uh, I think it, you probably embrace the concept of changing, uh, you know, making a, making a new, con, uh, new compact between uh, consumers and retailers so that uh, you know, retailers change some of their behavior that leads to some of this way, which is consumer growth. Digging McLaughlin. Um, two, two questions. One of them is um, we understand that, uh, I mean, I've spent a lot of time trying to get food into the hands of shelters and the, home, and the homeless from restaurants, from supermarkets, and so on. And so often I hear, we can't do that. And my question is, who's the we, and why can't they do that? Are there laws about this? Yeah, I, I assume you're talking about the we being the um, a shelter will say we can't take that, a, rest a restaurant will say we can't give that, a supermarket will say I'm not allowed to do that. I mean, why can't they put the produce well, out and mark it down by 50%, for instance? Um, there are some creative things happening along those lines where people are, uh, where stores are engaged in um, marking down and perfect fruit and perfect size and perfect shaped fruit. Um, uh, so there's, there are things happening along those lines. So the, the first part, uh, and I think Bill will probably talk about this a little bit tomorrow night, but if not, um, there's definitely fear of liability throughout the uh, donation process. Is it based on anything? Well, there's a good Samaritan law which protects donors who donate in good faith. Um, and so as long as you're donating in good faith, you're generally protected, right? But we live in a pretty litigious society, um, and that doesn't, that's really not, it's not always good enough for people that have the potential to donate, but uh, still fear the after, you know, a potential legal action from donating. So that that does play a role in um, in keeping a lot of uh, corporations from, from doing donations. Um, there are there are legal issues with donating food that is out, uh, that is already been out, uh, you know, prepared and out and served. So you, you can't take uh, food straight off of the pay line that's been served to people and then donate that. So. Uh, and I think there's state variability in those laws too. But fear of um, fear of liability is, is an issue. Fear of um, operational complexity is an issue where people just think it's too much time. Uh, it costs too much money to do it. Um, so there are a lot of that. But it costs a lot of money to throw all that food away. There is that too. And that's one of the benefits that we try and argue when we try and create this, this program. And some of them, I think, the simplicity argument is, uh, is a good one. There's a, I'll talk about some of these some different programs tomorrow. but. Um, there's a food recovery network in uh, Maryland that started on college campuses where students are simply um, capturing excess food that the dining hall is prepared and has to put out to, uh, to serve, right? And that gets uh, different uh, students take that to different shelters every night. And uh, these things, you know, sometimes the simplicity works and, and the school saves uh, the money in hauling away that food, the environment's uh, protected. People that get uh, that need food get it. So sometimes simplicity is is really one of the more powerful things in this. Um, there are a lot of barriers. Um, it's it's not. It, it, yeah, I'd be remiss to say that it's really easy to start all these programs. And, and um, when you're when you're trying to set them up with the agricultural producers and farmers, farmers are very busy. So that's that's just a flat out another thing that makes them some of them uh, difficult. But um, with good communication, with the belief in the need to, to start these donation programs and, and a communication about the benefits to them, reduced costs in the form of less uh, trash expense in the form of uh, tax deductions, and, and really just the social and the, you know, the environmental piece, but really at the top of it all is the, you know, the, the ability to help people. I went to some local farmers uh, a couple of years ago and I pitched one of these programs to them and, and they didn't know and I said, hey, listen, we, you know, we, have, um, we have more food more than we Need. Um, this is right after the tornadoes that scattered through the southwest. And so we know that there are people working out there. Um, we'd be happy to do this. And I said, do you need any sort of recovery? He says, no. My word's good enough for you. My word's good enough for you. He was very genuine, and, and there's a realization of need and, and a desire amongst a lot of people to, to really do good work. So 
it, it's, it takes communication to break through those barriers. Um, it takes communicating to people that they are protected from a legal standpoint, which is a big one. Um, but I'll get into some of those issues tomorrow. Okay. A, second, a second quick question. Chip Ordman has raised the question of what happens at Iris that I can go back and take to my community or my congregation and present to the high school or something like that. And um, in ministry, it is useful to have little curricula for adult religious ed. And I wondered if I were to um, try to create a brief curriculum for maybe two or three nights for adult RE, if you'd be willing to help me do that. Sure. <laughs> You ask me about all these people, what am I going to say? <laughs> but yes, I'd be happy to tell you. Hello. Jane Benson, you had an early slide, if I remember right, that was Field to Fork. Yes. <laughs> Oh. Well, it, it was short stages, the word oh. steps. So the last one is clean the plate. But the early steps, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, I can't think personally about the big distribution questions. But I'm aware of friends who run gleaning programs in Colorado or have assembled agreements with grocery stores. In food banks, the, in recent years in the Northwest, um, donations are weighed down by grocery stores because of the now secondary market of the, of the dollar stores, which is good in a way. It's not being wasted. And I think it's even true with their produce. But anyway, I was wondering if you could just take a minute to, to talk about some of those steps and things that kind of follow up on digging what where we can fit in if, if we're not strategic planners and distribution questions. Um, well, as you said, this is sort of a big picture look. This goes from harvest um, through post-harvest, uh, you know, through uh, production for, for, um, for animals. Uh, and, and you see an uptick in that, in that process, too. And then losses in distribution households. Um, I think this part down. Here, obviously, is the key for your for your, and you didn't mention the year for the food bank in Seattle area, right? Um, so I think this is obviously where you want to focus. Um, and I'm, you know, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an American area too. Right. Right. Yeah, and I so I would say, um, you know, green programs certainly good. Um, if there are local ag schools that you can partner with. Um, or local partners that you, uh, farms that you can partner with directly for plant and road type programs. Um, um, great things tend to, as soon as you create one of those relationships, they, they tend to build in my, my opinion, what I've seen so far. Um, for all kinds of reasons. And one, uh, you, you know, I started one with a local farmer who, um, who, okay, who knew that I had started one with another um, organization. And he had a spirit of healthy competition between him and, and this group, and so he, he wanted to, to do more. Uh, so he, um, and he did. Um, he also um, wanted to, um, you know, he'd never grown a certain crop before, and he wanted to uh, learn how to do it. And he said, he used this as an opportunity. So, you know, I'm already going to learn how to grow crop. I need to make an investment for a machine to do that. And uh, so I'll devote some of my, uh, some of my land to doing that to growing directly for you. So, I think there are great opportunities to do direct on a row uh, programs or direct, direct growing programs for organizations like yourself. That, that was so is, is um, uh, recapturing foods that are otherwise being lost uh, and getting them to the obvious, presenting themselves poor and uh, under um, okay. food, food insecure people, is that a significant piece of it? I guess for us. Sure. Yeah. And then what about um, legislatively, talking about will and raising the visibility of it as an, as an issue? Yeah, and I think legislatively one of the big issues is uh, you know providing incentives to, to create those donations, and one way to do that is to increase the cost of, of food waste going to the landfill. Right? So some northeastern states are getting on that bandwagon, Massachusetts, Vermont, I believe. Um, 
you know, legislation can increase the cost of the thing, uh, you know, growing food into the landfill. People are going to live in a hurry to or whatever other productive uses that they can be for. So. First of all, thank you for making the presentation and making us aware of something that is so huge. And um, this group is big thinkers about big things, and you're making a presentation about a big problem with big numbers. And sometimes I need to think about little things that I can imagine being possible. So I just wondered what you might think about these almost like Girl Scout cookie ideas. Um, that if there could be something called gypsy soup, and when you put food, not rotten food, but food that has been thrown away, but isn't, isn't molding in this you know, rotten, it's just old, you put that in a big soup and call it gypsy soup. And it could be known as gypsy soup. So lots of different organizations could make gypsy soup. And then gypsy soup would have the nutrients of all of the vegetables. So it would actually be very nutritious. You wouldn't have a lot of liability because you wouldn't be poisoning people. Um, I, just, I just wonder if gypsy soup would be a way to kind of get a lot of this food processed into, and lots of different organizations could have gypsy soup. And then I also wondered about you know, the popsicle man that goes around the neighborhood in the summertime. And we have these food deserts. I wondered if we couldn't take all that fresh fruit, not the rotten fruit, but the fresh fruit, and just make popsicles with no sugar, and just have the popsicle man take fresh fruit into the inner cities and just give. Yeah, their their um, conversion is a good idea. Storage is a big problem, so converting food into um, that would go bad for those vegetables would go bad into freezing it, um, converting into smoothies. Things that can be frozen in the refrigerator and extend their life, I think, is a great way to do that. Yeah, because it leads to killing whatever, too. And you can freeze it, and um, it makes it, you know, it extends the life, but it also makes it easy to distribute. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Thanks again. It's such a big time. Uh, thank you. So thank you for taking on the very big topic, which is are the savings and the additional food that can come about through Prevention, prevention of losses, whether it's in storage or in play waste or, or whatever. It's very, it's very, very important and it's something that the international community, I think, is spending a lot of time on now because they are also confronting these limits to production increases in grains and they want to see where the <laughs> losses to in fact produce the same thing. So um, just stick with FAO and see what they're actually doing if they're actually putting research to their words. But on the other, I guess I take it on a commodity by commodity basis. So where where are the losses occurring, and who might address the losses? So on um, basic grains, are you dealing with the the big grain dealers? Are they the ones that are dealing with the, with these kinds of losses and all address them? and also addressing them through the milling and the additional food processing um, process of the food chain? Are the base, are these the folks who could be most involved? And question of produce. Um, for the produce that receives um, very wide distribution, these regulations on what can be sold as grade A or not, produce are negotiated between US and the US, or between USDA and, uh, and the commodity producers, who then have an impact on what the consumers expect to have. But are these um, commodity producers and USDA who negotiate what the standards will be, are they involved in these kinds of negotiations to think about what is? Um, and then the third, Category that I think about are grains and basic grains and legumes, including peanuts, that have huge problems with storage that renders them not only waste, waste product wasteful but also unsafe, as in aflatoxins. And who gets involved in those? That's what we saw with that terrible peanut butter peanut scandal a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> so can you just comment on one of those three? Who, 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 who should do it? I think um, that's a big question to a big topic. Um, you know, my work has been predominantly at the local level. Um, I think I, I think there's an opportunity for companies and people along the chain, um, certainly big retailers. Uh, I'm sorry to get more um, 
I think there, you know, processors. I think they're at every stage all the way. I think there are there are opportunities for um, partnerships to to make headway in this area and, and productive ones and, and partnerships that will um, reduce costs at, at every stage along the way too. Um, I can't really speak to your third one about um, who's watching the store in terms of uh, items that would. Um, if stored would, you know, stored would, would cause even more problems. I just, I just don't have experience in that myself, so I'd be, it would be worth it. What's that? It might get used. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you know, you have to, you have to uh, manage for that, and you have to protect the downside because um, if you have a, a project that, you know, where you're trying to do some of this work and, and you have a negative outcome where people could get sick from something that, you know, from an effort to recapture or reclaim food. Uh, you know, it's it's, going, it's only going to hurt future efforts. So I think I think it's a state's responsible management throughout the process. Steve, you said that we have a priority. Yeah. Did you want to comment on? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, right there. So. We talk a lot of time and say from the top players and speak on your people, but a lot of food isn't safe, race levels, and so there's other opportunities to handling food waste at that point that it's not useful for them to participate. Still a healthy environment. Feeding animals, that's such a physical opportunity. Industrial use refers to energy. And what the digesters are generating methane from food waste, capturing that methane and using it for electricity generation. That's having a lot of farms. And then composting is the last resort for landfilling, and that, of course, is just returning that organic matter to a soil amendment. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. You made me think a lot about systems, so I have a couple things. One is at the very bottom of the family system that I was thinking of the link between obesity and food waste because portion sizes are not. Uh, hardly any family knows what a portion size serving is, whether it's for an adult or a child. And so families are often overcooking food, even families that don't have a lot of resources are overcooking uh, extra food. They don't understand what a healthy portion size is, and also they don't, uh, labeling around portion and serving sizes is often on uh, packaged foods is not all that clear about what constitutes serving. And, and, um, so I think there's some family system work that can be done, but I was really struck by your circle and by the fact that maybe one of the understanding points is what the big system is, and then maybe uh, using processes, or talking about using processes as like Six Sigma or the lean process, or continuous improvement or quality improvement to really improve the system, but first understanding what the system is and how it's linked back. And then the third thing was we can send peaches to Taiwan to be packaged and then bring them back as peaches. We can probably get the extra food back to other parts. Yeah, I, I think the system view is definitely a, a great way to, to think about this. And there are just so many benefits along the way to corporations from, from engaging in, in programs to try and reduce their waste and put it to good use. I, I, I mean, I have a few experiences with this, but at one high-end store, um, you know, I, I went to uh, to get a breakfast sandwich one day, and, and it was, I don't know, 11 o'clock, maybe I thought it was 11. And um, I was perfectly well on the day for it, and the boy just took it and, and took it and chucked it in the trash, and I said, I wouldn't take that. No, it shrinks. I mean, just like and shrink. You know, they're just conditioned to shrink. Is you know, it's it's five minutes over, and you know, we can't do that. Um, another same store, another store where, where all these pieces are out on display, and and uh, it's, it's a time limit, and one other sort of one slice of the piece of the other side more there. And I was about to get one of those, and, and I wish I could explain how how quickly the <laughs> the process of folding seven slices up into one slice that, that got thrown out, it, it took about three seconds. It was, it was really very artistic and, uh, and, and, and the speed. And, uh, and I just I said, uh, do you, you know, make the effort to, to donate any of that? No. We, we throw a lot of and do you think, what do you think about that? Yes, yeah, it's too bad. It's really good. good, good. But no. You know, both of those cases, there's no challenging the mindset from above, which you know, there's no bottom up. It's just this is what you do, and no one questions it. So, 
I think looking at, at a bigger perspective is, uh, is valuable. And, and there are great settings, different ways of doing this and engaging with these programs. And, um, you, know, you mentioned the, the you know, plate size there, there. You could find some things out about it. There's a slide I don't have it, but about the, the size of the, the American portions from 20 years ago or whatever. And, and so um, it, it's they're pretty telling. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to address uh, uh, Hugh Joseph's uh, uh, critique uh, and see if I can uh, clarify some of the issues that, uh, uh, that you uh, identified and, and, and that are embedded in your, uh, the answers which are embedded in your presentation. Uh, first is, um, at a global scale, the FAO data that you use, I think you might have one of those, one or two of those um, uh, charts in your, uh, do you want to shift over to one or two of those? Maybe the, the serial one? I think there's one from serial. Uh, um, yeah, that's, I guess that's one of them. There, is, there are others. Uh, I would rather just look at the serial one because it's so much clearer. There it is, yeah. This one, um, this is developing countries in post iris and processing. By the way, this this came out in the fall of 2011, uh, and it was an earth-shaking report because it was the first time that these factors were identified so clearly. Uh, so if you look at Europe, North America, the industrialized Asia, and then look at these red areas, and the red areas are the consumers versus the production. That is, is to uh, retailers. So this is what the consumers do with waste, and this is what the system does with waste. So it's sort of farm to fork, well, farm to grocery store in a sense uh, is what we're talking about um, in, the, in the North American situation. And so what we have is a huge amount of waste after after it gets through the system, either on our plates or in our refrigerators or on the shelves of these stores that you're identifying the flip flop pizza guys' uh, hands. In other words, this is where the waste is occurring. On the other hand, there's a vast amount of waste in these other places, for example, in Latin America or North uh, in Africa. So the amount of waste, if you notice, is very high in all of these places, but it's for very different reasons. The reasons are, are in the harvest process, in the field that this is happening. There's no way to distribute the food, we, well, it's, or, or there's no way to store the food. So it's the entire food chain. If you think about the food chain before it reaches the markets, then you'll understand what's happening in the rest of the world. That's a vast waste of food. So the word waste, you is, is, and I'm sure you probably know this, is applied across, and you know this, of course, too, is applied across the boards. And so this, your discussion tonight is largely based upon this column of waste, even though this is for cereal. Uh, I think this is, this, is, this is total consumption. This is total uh, retail and consumer consumption. So you get a sense of what this is here. So my point is, is that now if you focus on that one, it's very clear that resources, as, as Steve has said, I think, resources are going to be saved through this source of waste. So uh, if you would if you would cut that. And that resources, right now we know that the price of meat in China is closely connected and, and the price of many other foods throughout the world are closely connected to the price of corn in the United States. Um, we know that for a fact that the price Sort of equalizes you know, in terms of whatever the commodity price is. That's what the that's what the number is for everybody plus whatever is added locally, which can be very substantial. So my point is that there's enormous savings here that does funnel back if the if the system the the, the commodity system allows that price to actually be saved. And I would argue there has to be a savings of that because you're using less resources, as you were saying. And I think that's so critically important. The other things, of course, are the, the effects of the environment, of, of the waste. Clearly, there's an effect 
you know, greenhouse gases and all the rest of the things that, that, that we do. But I thought it was important to clarify that for everybody. I think these are things you both knew, but I think that maybe not everybody uh, knew the significance of this concept of waste, which is broad and across the boards, and does, in my point finally, is, is in 2013, that total amount of waste would feed all the hungry people in the world, if we were able to distribute. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for sharing with us your uh, food waste porn. Um, you and I are both kind of outsiders to Iris, so I'm going to step outside my comfort zone a bit. Um, just some thoughts and reflections on this, because this is a very uh, big problem. But it struck me that the uh, first presentation of this week on Pika Bread, Pinky? Uh, to the way we treat food now is probably never have I seen such a, a, an example of the scale between the sacred and the profane. Um, it seems to me that our civilization has grown to the point where, where we've used industry and others as mediating forces between ourselves and our relationship with the food we eat that sacredness of food that give us this day your daily bread, the idea that, that, that what we put into us is a is part of the land and it's a sacred part. Um, I mean, I think we're, we, we, as a society, as a culture, as a civilization, has lost that. And I would say from an Irish point of view, um, again, with Ian's presentation the other day, which also struck me with the science and technology on one side of that square and with religion and ethics on the other, that what we're hearing is solutions that might work on that technical side. But I would venture that the solution to this problem, the fundamental solution, really lies on the other side. It really lies on the, on the valuing, the the religion, the ethical, the moral side of how we, as a civilization, see food uh, and how we respect it. And uh, if our anthropologists and our theologians uh, can't keep us in touch as a people with the basic sacredness of the food and that whole cycle of us working with our environment, um, I don't think any amount of technology or economics or collection processes are going to end that problem. I think it's fundamental respect for food itself uh, and, and the, the work that goes into it, the value that's in it, the resources that are in it, uh, and uh, it's, it's really a lack of grace to be able to treat food in the way we treat it now. So, yeah, I agree. I think it's a great point. I agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the theme of uh, valuing food uh, to a greater degree. And I think this is obviously, I, I think most people in this audience would agree with that. So great, great comments. I think we've strayed a long way uh, from that as I tried to get across tonight. And uh, so definitely agree. Uh, can I share um, so when I was like a little bit younger and a little bit before, there was something called dumpster diving. That's uh, perhaps in New York you with, but um, that many young people actually do. They're aware of this problem and that there's actually such a huge amount of food available behind stores and dumpsters. Um, so my first question is, were you ever tempted to dumpster dive yourself if you were sleeping on these pictures? I could have easily done it. I could have easily. I didn't. Uh, I, I could it's, it's, And it's a, you know, it's a shame to see. I mean, it, they're very they're powerful pictures, and it's a shame. And, and you know, the, the concept you're talking about, there's a term for it called freeganism. And um, there are people that are committed to it, and that are, that are you know, interested in, um, in reducing the impact on the environment and using some of this food. And, uh, so it's it's a, it's a well-known concept. And, and as I've shown tonight, I, if you're in the right area, you probably do it pretty easily. Yeah. Um, okay, I was actually wondering, uh, I have a few 
few questions. Um, has food waste, if we gave like a time trajectory of food waste in the States, is that, has it always been as pronounced as it is today? And then going back to the EPA hierarchy triangle, um, I was wondering if you could give an example of some creative uh, solutions um, projects that are already underway addressing each one of those um, each one of those elements. Um, and then I was also wondering if there are other countries who are effectively responding to this issue of food waste um, that could possibly follow that model. Okay. Um, as far as the history, I started here in the 70s. Um, that's about as far back as I've gone. Uh, I think you know, a lot of the literature talks about you know, in the war years, there was less waste and there was more waste. You know, much more. But the, that theme of the value of the food was much more paramount. And so um, I don't have statistics on it back uh, prior to the 70s. Um, so that's one aspect. Um, the second part, um, Creative programs. I, I've done a couple locally uh, with a, a <laughs> an agricultural college um, with uh, food banks and food pantries in the area um, with some local farmers uh, doing the same thing. Um, we're, um, there's a great project in Philadelphia that I'm working on with Tom right now actually to um, sort of draw a, a, a circle around a certain portion of the city and effectively look for ways to capture all excess food in that area and, and divert it both for um, human consumption um, and, and if not, um, you can talk too much about animal behavior, yeah, but that's a, bit, a definite option, um, and, uh, and for compost. So, um, and there are lots of programs like that all around the country um, going on. Um, your, your third one, Europe, um, is, uh, is ahead of us in this game, I think. They're, um, you know, they, they're making declarations of uh, uh, you know, certain years and setting certain time goals for you know, eliminating uh, rest of reducing um, organic food waste. And, and, uh, and you're starting to see that here with states starting to get on the top board with um, um, banning food waste. From going to so there's, you know, and that, that's, that's good work. Um, tomorrow on the food down um, in the workshop, I'll, I'll go through. Um, some data and conversations that I've had with uh, maybe 20 different food banks around the country, and, and I'll talk about some of the things that they and they, they're all they all vary based on their their location primarily and what's around them, um, but also their you know, resources that, that they have available to them. But it's it's very interesting. They all have their unique um, strengths and, and skills, and, and um, they kind of marry that up with what's available to them in their local areas. So I'll, I'll talk about some of those tomorrow in the workshop. Well, I enjoyed your presentation and, of course, your slides. Uh, you can see that we've had a lot of fun. Uh, right. uh, a lot of interesting experiences in gaining, them, gaining access to those slides. I want to make one comment and ask if you uh, are familiar with any questions. Uh, I want to put a comment is, are you familiar with the book called Trash by William Ramsey? Uh, it's the Arizona uh, garbage studies, and it's done by anthropologists using archaeological methodologies uh, to look into the garbage cans uh, in a city in Arizona and to do the analysis, because really all archaeology is is an analysis of human waste and, and refuse uh, from the past. Uh, <laughs> well, you call a culture to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you got the, the other anthropologists. But what they found, and it was also replicated in a study in the UK, was that as incomes decreased, people bought less familiar foods, number one, and foods that were of, of lesser grades. The meat is the easiest example, uh, but you can also do it in bread and produce. And as they bought these less familiar foods, they threw more of them out than if they had bought a high quality spread. Uh, even in smaller quantities for the same amount of money, they would have used it all up. Uh, so it, it was a very, very interesting finding of the kinds of waste uh, that people have and the uh, influence <coughs> of declining incomes uh, and income streams 
especially in times of stress and loss of a, a job, for example, of one member of the household counts as <laughs> So you may want to factor some of those things in. But my question um, is about um, uh, who wrote that? Uh, William Rafter. Right, thank you. Is it trash or is it garbage? No, it's not garbage. Oh, garbage. Maybe it's called garbage. It's garbage. It is garbage. Sorry. Garbology is the name of what he named to be the study of that. That's right. Garbology. Sorry, it's been too long since I've read that. It's a wonderful book. I'm going to reread it. It's on my shelf. Okay, so here's here's a question. Um, is part of waste at the household level, and certainly in traditional markets around the world, are there any gender issues related to waste? And should we be considering them? So let me just uh, uh, say at the household level, more women than men buy food uh, at supermarkets or at markets. Uh, more women than men uh, repair the food and decide about portions, usage, waste, peeling, um, you know, all the things that contributes to household waste from food as opposed to from paper. But they also are implicated in sacred goods uh, as well. And um, children's preferences <coughs> are also factored in. So the, they may repair foods, but the children, you know, I call them uh, 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 guerrilla war warfare in the household. I have had children who, when the parent is not looking, just goes over to the garbage can and gets rid of that uh, food that they, they didn't want to eat. So, it really, at the household level, women are responsible for the marketing and what they, and it starts at the grocery store as to what the waste is going to turn into. So if you have poor choices, if you overbuy, if the cuts are not familiar, if you buy unfamiliar things because you want to try them, that and the marketing has gotten to you uh, and is mostly <coughs> to do that, that's going to wind up in, in uh, the garbage. So that's number one. In traditional societies, the uh, women have very few storage, and you know, you have that refrigeration. And that. So then uh, they lose all the products uh, that way. So it really is quite genderized and affects their income. They call the worst things with their own families. What about men? Because gender issues are both men and women, or women and men. Men may be unfamiliar with the foods, and so they toss things out of the refrigerator. They may not know how to fix them. Uh, they may not know whether they're spoiled or not. And most people who are heads and directors of supermarkets are men and who are making those decisions as to what to throw out and what's fresh and what's not fresh. And corporate is mostly run by men. So I do see uh, waste as a genderized issue, uh, both at the household level and at the supermarket level. So would you care to comment on that? Um, congratulations. I've never been asked that before. Uh, <laughs> um, I would, uh, and I, I would say that I've, I've really addressed it um, in total and not a lot better minds. I, I would say that um, you know confusion over issues like sell by dates, and sell before dates, and use by dates. Um, whether that you know that can that can confuse anyone, whether it's a woman or a man in the household. So I I couldn't comment as to um, who it impacts more. Uh, that and lack of you know, knowledge about how to prepare foods, I think, is another issue. And so if you're organic foods that you're not familiar with, that's a problem. Um, lack of knowledge of just how long certain products last um, is an issue. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm, sure there, I'm sure there might be some data out there on that. I haven't seen it. Um, but then again, I haven't really looked for it um, either. But, um, Okay, good. I'd like to hear the results next year. All right. Okay. Uh, I appreciate that there's still some questions to go, but I am mindful of two things. First, and most importantly, that Stephen has been standing on his feet for the last two hours talking and taking questions, and also that uh, the time is advancing. So, can I just ask? Could we keep these questions very short, please? And just a quick question that can be a quick response. I think other opportunities to talk to Stephen and just do the workshop. <coughs> That's fine. Thanks for that. 
chipboard and then I'll be as quick as I can. Um, my wife asks whether it would be useful for people to be in touch with national charities such as American Second Harvest who might have expertise or influence with corporate headquarters. But that leads me to the more general question of sharing expertise and avoiding reinventing the wheel. A couple of churches in Memphis, Tennessee, recently simply established a clearinghouse so that there is now a list of all the food banks and all the meal places serving to the homeless in the city so they can share information. So that, for example, the kosher food bank and the halal food bank are now comparing notes. Um, if a food bank is faced with someone with celiac or gluten intolerance, they can call up the food bank that has expertise about that. Right. That's a great point. I think there is no there's a lot of um, there are a lot of food banks, there are a lot of food pantries, there are a lot of food shelves out there um, that are run by a lot of committed people who want to do um, the best work that they can, and um, there is often the potential for duplication of effort. There is no need to reinvent the wheel in some cases, I think. But often when I talk to people, there is um, a realization that the best thing that they can do is to facilitate um, getting food to from one place to another, and um, they don't always need to go and pick it up themselves and deliver it with their own truck. Um, sometimes just communicating using the phone and facilitating more local connection um, can uh, result in that food being picked up and distributed um, in a less expensive fashion and can create, can create local relationships too. So um, I think it's a great question. I think there is a way to cover it. I think that um, oftentimes a great thing to do is just is to create a list, like you just said, of different um, different food banks, different pantries, and food shelves in certain areas that cover certain areas, and, and uh, um, you know, for getting that information out there to people is, is a very effective way to um, you know create efficient pickups and, and distribution. So, um, yeah, distribution it, it, it's a good point. I'll try to be uh, quick as well. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I just have to acknowledge that this slide of the rotisserie chickens here uh, in the trash can uh, really affects me because, uh, from my perspective, these are some bodies that suffered and gave their lives, and now for no reason other than to end up in the trash. Uh, which made me also wonder, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but I know that a great, uh, there's a large percentage of livestock that <laughs> dies in the, in the uh, process of transportation from, like, the, where they were raised to the slaughterhouse, uh, especially, like, in the middle of the winter when they're being in the back of the truck and uh, they literally freeze to death, or in the summer they, they go without water and end up dying. Uh, or down or cows that cannot, by FDA regulation, be slaughtered. So there's a lot of tonnage and a lot of uh, grain that has gone into that and a lot of tonnage. And I'm wondering in the, in the statistics of that 40% of the tonnage that you were talking about, is that factored in the, the loss of animals and life and, and transport? Is that figured yeah. into, that, yeah. into that number? Okay. <laughs> It's a good way to look at it, though. I, I mean, I, I like your phrase. I think those are bodies in there that, that didn't go to good use. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a proper way to look at it. <laughs> Definitely in sympathy with the spirit, but I'll, I'll take your time for a position and say that we need waste because over my career, one of the things I've become very familiar with the psychotic population, which we're not feeding. And they are feeding themselves out of dumpsters, dumpster diving, and other things. And uh, it's, I would love to see a study to find out how many calories are actually gotten from the waste bin in a psychotic population in the street, because that's clearly something we've neglected. And these poor individuals wander around uh, in a different reality and get hungry enough to <laughs> stop by your local garbage can. And I think we need to document that. Yeah, and I haven't seen data on that. I have sort of interesting point that I haven't I have heard recently heard someone say, Thank God we have the ways that we do. Because it's a it's a buffer, it's a protection against how much we discussed yesterday, it's a it's a buffer of protection against uh, some extreme agricultural event that wipes out a lot of food and it's a point of view. Um, I don't you know, my focus is a little bit different, but um, yeah. 
On, on that note, for people who are interested, there's um, there's a couple of documentaries. One's called Die, and another one is called Dumpster. And it just shows the, the waste and also the rescues. Uh, and and I, I recommend them. So you can look them up on um, um, that's sit here this week. Not YouTube, but um, Amazon? Yes, yeah, Netflix. Uh, they're on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Can I just once again see you expressing gratitude for the last one? Um, folks, two last quick notices. First, just to remind you, there is a movie tonight, The Power of Community, How Cuba Survived Big Oil, that's down in the boat house at 10 o'clock. And secondly, if anybody has lost uh, a mobile phone, it's in a case with little elephants on the back, you need to come and just to it before you leave. Well, I was like, somebody left a hand in charge Thank you. 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 Thank you.